Glad you're back tonight, and we are excited to have our final event with you this uh, this uh, this week, and get to share with you all about dinosaurs and all the good stuff. And of course, as I like to do, to promote a few things for you. And one is the brand new open last month ICR Discovery Center. The ICR Discovery Center. We've got brochures back there for them. This is a ministry that we have just l fallen in love with. We are so blessed. Uh, of Creation Truth Foundation to get to work with ICR on a pretty frequent basis. Uh, there's often times where their scientists, a lot of the scientists we've been mentioning this week, and their books back there, and their resources, and, and people we've talked about are uh, almost colleagues of ours. We get to work with them and find out the latest scientific research, stuff that's going on, and to share it then with you all when we go places uh, all around the country. And just last month, they finally opened a three-year project they've been working on, their brand new discovery. Center. Anybody ever been to like the Creation Museum over in Kentucky? Okay. All right. You've heard about that. Ken Ham answers Genesis. Well, this one's in Dallas, Texas. It's by the scientist. Has all this latest state-of-the-art technology and really amazing, cool stuff. And so, if you're ever needing a good field trip to a good uh, creation museum, we told them we would tell everybody because uh, we very much enjoy working with them. They use our fossils sometimes. We use their scientists, you know, and stuff. So we just got a wonderful, great working relationship with them. And uh, because of that, this year we have lots of new books that we didn't have last year because they've been putting out a whole bunch of new material all the way for kids and uh, and books for people of all ages like the kid at heart okay and and all kinds of fun stuff written by their scientists and so we're really excited to share with you that good news about all that kind of stuff so anybody here want to learn about dinosaurs yeah okay really after three other nights of it <laughs> You haven't gotten enough of dinosaurs yet? No. Okay, all right. That's good to know. That's right. So we're going to get rocking and rolling on some dinosaurs. And tonight, let's finally find out how all these dinosaurs fit in precisely with God's Word. The first night, we covered dinosaurs in... Movies, that's right, in movies, in museums, in television, in the culture, and how a great deal of the stuff that we think we know about dinosaurs, is it actually scientifically true? No, the way they're portrayed in movies, it's a lot of stuff is made up for the magic of the movies, yet it's influenced our understanding of what we think a dinosaur can do and how a dinosaur might behave and how a dinosaur would do this or that and all these kinds of other. And so we went through a bunch of those kinds of things and looked about how T-Rex could actually behave and how the Pachycephalosaurus and all that kind of stuff. And we saw, though, that behind some of that is an agenda a worldview driven agenda to try to get us to believe a story a story that is not biblical. Remember a lot of that stuff? A lot of those things about the evolutionary process and the biggest thing about dinosaurs today is they evolved into what? Birds. They evolved into birds. They put feather wings on these dinosaurs and say they turned into birds. When we looked at the science, have we ever found any of that? No. But you're going to read all kinds of stuff all over the place that that is a settled science. And anybody who denies feathered dinosaurs, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, they're, they're feathered dinosaur deniers. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's about what it's come down to, okay? I mean, they're so... Into, and when we showed you, they have, they have nothing upon which to base that except for a worldview they're trying to drive home here. Then, Matt shared with you about... Uh, what did you talk about, Matt? I was asleep. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, Matt, <laughs> Matt shared with you some incredible stuff about fossils and how fossils are made. And in order to make a fossil. Does anybody remember what you need? That's right. Lots of mud and lots of water. And over a long period of time, no, you need it when? Quickly, right now. Otherwise, that stuff will decay and go away. And so he showed you what great event would provide us with all these billions and billions of fossils all over the planet that all needed lots of mud and lots of water very quickly. What event was that? The flood of Genesis. 
explains that better than anything. And so then he also shared with you some of the incredible science that's been coming out about dinosaurs and the soft tissue stuff and original biochemical materials in these things that can any of that stuff last for millions and millions of years? No, absolutely not. We have, we have actual shelf dates for these, these types of materials and stuff. You know how you have a shelf date for food, okay, and for, you know, for your produce and all that kind of stuff? There's shelf, there's shelf dates, shelf life for uh, how long some of this material can last. And it's thousands of years, not millions. So that right there tells us that dinosaurs scientifically, can we, do we have a scientific basis to say they're millions of years old? No. And then he showed you there's carbon-14 in the fossils. That definitely shouldn't be there. That, again, and all this kind of stuff. Everything that we wouldn't be surprised by, but that they say should not be there, guess what we're finding? The stuff that shouldn't be there if these things are millions of years old and conflict with the Bible. So how does this all fit in with the Bible now? Well, let's go back to the very beginning. In the beginning... God That's exactly right. God created the heavens and the earth. And then the Bible gives us his first-hand account, precisely what he did on each day of the creation week. How many days did he actually take to create everything in our cosmos? Six days. And then what did he do on the seventh? He rested. And he pronounced this incredibly perfectly good. And he established for us our human economy of a seven-day week. And I talked about that the other night. Okay, now here's the deal. All of the wing creatures and all of the water creatures, remember, I'm going to check you. I'm going to check you. Is that guy a dinosaur? Yeah. No, he's not. Very good. You remembered. He is not a dinosaur. The guy over here with the flippers, the water guy, the Tylosaurus there, is he a dinosaur? Yeah. No, he's not. Man, this is so good. You remember stuff. See, I used to be a school teacher. This is exciting. Students remember something. <laughs> Teachers back there are like, I know what you mean. Okay, so are these guys dinosaurs? Yeah. Why? Because they're they are land animals. That's right. A dinosaur is a land reptile, and they walk upright on their legs, unlike other reptiles that have their legs sprawled out. So very good. You remember. So the winged and the water, what number day of creation would they have been made? Five. The land animals, what day would they? Six. Does that include dinosaurs? How can you prove that? Because they're dinosaurs. Because they're dinosaurs. <laughs> And God's not going to leave out dinosaurs, right? <laughs> exactly. That's what he means by that. Exactly. Here's the amazing thing. The text tells us. The scriptures, if you take this as your foundation and believe this, it tells us the answers to these questions. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That God would not leave us to guess about these things. That long before we would even start to ask some of these questions, he already had the answers right here. So, let me show you in the text how this works. Genesis chapter 1, in verse 24, God starts talking about day number 6. And he says, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. Some look at that and they say, okay, those words can mean maybe domesticated and undomesticated. And some of those words can mean uh, to include lots of creatures. But how can we say for certain that would include dinosaurs? Because when we look at it even in greater detail, get a little more focus on it, we find out that the words here for like cattle is the word behema in the plural. We know the word behemoth from Job chapter 40. What is that? It's the biggest ever. That's what it is. So it means the biggest, largest of all creatures ever. And then it says, and the creeping things. All the itty bitty littlest things. And then the beast, pretty much everything else in between. So think about this. God says on day six, when it comes to the land creatures, each according to their kind, he made the most gigantic to the idiotiest, bittiest, and everything in between. Does that leave anything out? No. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? So would that include then dinosaurs? Yeah. Absolutely. He, it's like he made sure to put all these things in there. Now then, who else does he make on that day? 
Man. What's his name? Adam. Adam. Adam and Eve. And he made who else? Eve. Eve. Adam and Eve living there. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So according to the Bible, what's the truth about dinosaurs and when people lived? At the same time. So think about it. If you went to a zoo back then, how cool would that be if, you know, you really could go and, and experience your very own Jurassic World? Aren't you, aren't you thinking it's pretty cool? Aren't you getting excited? Is that, That's because every time we see it in the movies, they end up chasing you. That's why you're not excited. Uh, I think it's exciting. Okay. Now then. Matt talked about this. Mr. Matt talked about this. We have dinosaurs alive with people, and then there's this great event that made almost all of the fossils that we find in the world today. What event was that? The flood. So is that when all the dinosaurs went extinct? No, why not? Oh, what was Noah told would be joining him on the ark? Two of every kind of animal. Now, you see, that kind thing is important there. Mr. Matt kind of mentioned this, all right? Does it mean we have every variety of dog? No. How many varieties of dog can you mention? Too many. That's very good. Yes. Can you, can you, can you give me any there? Collies, beagles. Ter uh, Terrier, Labrador, St. Bernard, German shepherd. German shepherd. There you go. Great purities. Yeah, okay. The list keeps going on and on and on. How many does Noah need on the ark, though? Two. Two. Okay. How many cats does Noah need on the ark? Two. The correct answer is none. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 al you almost got down right. But, okay. See, we have a, we have a saber tooth here called a Smilodon, and he's got these big honking, you know, big, big teeth. In fact, he's missing a couple of extra teeth there that most uh, felines have because he's got to have room for those. He can open his mouth to 90 degrees, so he's got room for those. We can only open ours about 20 to 30 degrees, and uh, he weighed in around, what is it, 900 pounds, 700 pounds, 700 pound cat. A little different from your little calico, correct? Okay. But how many does Noah need on the ark? Two. Because these kinds that the Lord would have brought to him, the male and the female of them, they would have had all the genetic information you need to get all the different varieties we have today. In fact, a lot of our varieties, a lot of our breeds that we have today have only come about in the last couple hundred years. Yeah. Okay. So the, they would have had full genetic information to get on it. In fact, answers in genetics. Genesis, uh, I forgot to bring this book up. Matt, Matt, in fact, Matt showed it to you last night. Answers in Genesis, when they made their big ark in Kentucky, their big full-size ark down there, they, many years leading up to that, they had their specialists working on how many animals are we going to need on the ark to get all the varieties we have today. And they took into account everything that's alive, everything that's extinct that we know of, and it wasn't just two of every kind. For all the clean animals, we've got seven pairs of those, the male and the female of each. So, putting that all into, uh, into uh, their, their calculations, their latest number, this is as uh, this summer, uh, their latest number is 1,398 total kinds for a total of, and by the way, all, seven pairs of all the birds, all those ones, 6,744 animals total on the ark is what their current number is. And from that, you can get all the varieties we have today. Mr. Matt t said, well, how, about do, how do we fit uh, the dinosaurs on there? Yeah. Exactly right. The average adult size of dinosaurs is the size of a bison. Not that one, that one, okay? <laughs> the average size of a bison. The average juvenile size is the size of a sheep. There are 60, give or take, 60 dinosaur kinds so in total, how many dinosaurs do you need on the ark? Two. Two of each one, so times 60, 120 sheep-sized reptiles. They have their own little corner called little Jurassic Ark over there, okay? They got their own little corner there. They're going, are they going to fit on the ark with, with any problem? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wait a minute now. If we've got dinosaurs on the ark, what are we going to have on the earth 
after the flood? Dinosaurs. Wait a minute, though. We're going to have civilizations all over the planet that are going to be making records of their lives, of their existence. If dinosaurs are alive, what should we find in their records? Records of dinosaurs. This is where I get excited. <laughs> See, I'm one of those boring history teachers. That's what, my, that's what my background is. That's my degree, is history, historical research, research methods, and going back and looking at and deciphering, is this a reliable resource or not, and did this really happen or not? And so when we talk about historic dinosaurs, that's when I get excited, because I'm not a scientist, okay? So that's why I let Matt do all the science, okay? That's I'm like, because... Because he's just brainy like that. He likes the science stuff. I'm like, I want to study the old ancient people who aren't alive anymore. Because they don't pester you. You know, they, they're, they're, fun to they're, they're, they're fun to check out. So, what am I going to be looking for when I look for dinosaurs in history? Almost, almost sounds like a Muppets episode. <laughs> dinosaurs in history. Remember the pigs in space. Okay. We're go okay, I'm going to look at the Bible. But it, what am I going to look for in the Bible? Evidence. Evidence. Okay. So I should be able to go to my table of contents here, look up dinosaur, and see how many times dinosaur is listed. Is that right? <laughs> no. Dinosaur is not going to be listed in the Bible? Why not? Well, when was our Bible written? It was written over a few thousand years by about 40 different authors through, through several generations of people, uh, all inspired by one Lord God and His Holy Spirit. And the word dinosaur would not have been something they would have had access to because the word dinosaur is very recent. 1841 is when the word dinosaur came about. So Richard Owen took these two Greek words to try to describe what this was we were finding. See, we're starting to find all these fossils, and we're finding fossils that have scary teeth in them. And we're finding fossils that have big, sharp horns on them. And we're finding fossils with big domes and spikes and claws and things like that. And he's like, we need a fancy term for this. Because we're going to be scientists, and we have to be sophisticated when we talk about them, so we need a scientific word. And so he came up with this word, dinosaurus, dinosauria, for, to describe all. The two Greek words literally mean, to make this word, big scary reptile. The word dinosaur literally means big scary reptile. Oh... He publishes that word in 1842. So, I then, as I'm going to go back and look at ancient civilizations, I'm going to be looking for a word before that in other civilizations that means big, scary reptile. Can you think of any words that might mean big, scary reptile? I heard it. What is a dragon? A big, scary reptile. In every depiction of any kind, whether it's more on the, the fantasy side or more on the factual side, it's always a big, scary reptile. You start looking at how the word has been used in history, such as in the Greek and the Latin and many others, in the old Welsh and the old English and the old German and all those. It means every time, big scary reptile. And so I think it's funny when the all-knowing Wikipedia has to talk about this. It has to admit right there, the Greek and Latin term referred to any great serpent, reptile, not necessarily mythological. It has to admit, in history, this has referred to real creatures. So, what are we looking for? It's interesting, the realizations that some of these scientists have had to make. When my friend went to the, uh, the uh, Children's Museum in Indianapolis, uh, Matt's been there, I have not had the opportunity yet, um, they found, that, well, the museum didn't find, the paleontologist found it and gave it to him, this great dinosaur that when they did their um, signage for it, they, they wrote this. It says, it's a new type of dinosaur that looks like a dragon. It's called the Draco Rex Hogwartsia. 
And when they dug it up, they're like, it looks like a dragon. <laughs> and so the question on one of the signs they used to have up there was, is it a dragon or a dinosaur? The answer to that is, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing as Pachycephalosaurus, except it doesn't have what? It doesn't have the big dome on there, okay? So one of the ideas from paleontologists is because it's smaller, it's younger, and it hasn't grown its dome yet. But we can't say that for certain, so they went ahead and gave it its own specific name. Instead of Pachycephalosaurus, they gave it the name Draco Rex. But tell me, when you look at even Pachy, what's that look like that could be described as to you? Huh? Doesn't that, that kind of match up what you would kind of think of drag? I mean, doesn't that kind of look like something you can see on Sleeping Beauty or something like that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, we're starting to make some connections here with the clues we're given in history about these creatures. So let's go to the Bible. Does the Bible use a word that means big scary reptile? Yes, it does. In the Hebrew, it's the word tanin. Everybody say tanin. Tanin. It refers to big scary reptiles both in the water and on land. Noticing there's a connection there, this reptilian aspect to them. So, how would we translate that word today? Well, that's interesting. There's all kinds of different translations. What's neat about that is the old King James, 21 times it translated the word as dragon. And the other six times the word is used in the scriptures, because it's used a total of 27 times, it refers to it as sea monster or serpent, reptile. So every time this word means big scary reptile. If we were to use our modern word... For big scary reptile, which is what? Dinosaur. Dinosaur. Wouldn't it be interesting how our Bibles might read? We might get passages like Job 30, I'm a brother to dinosaurs and a companion to owls. Or Psalm 91 13, tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the dinosaur. These aren't the only places. In Isaiah, he talks about the habitation of these dragons or tanines or dinosaurs four times. Jeremiah talks about the dens or dwelling places of them four times. It's always listed with other real creatures. So why would this tanine, this dragon, be something other than a real creature? Do we have anything, do we have anything upon which to say this isn't a real creature? That it's something mythological? No. No, that, that, that would be total worldview driven. That would be a, a major assumption upon which we have no basis. Job gets a tour of creation when he's going through his struggles in life. As God takes him around and says, let me show you just how mighty and awesome I am. And why, when you're going through troubles, guess whom you should place your faith the one who created all things and can handle all things. Amen? Amen? Amen. So he gets to see in chapters 38 through 41 a whole bunch of animals. A lion, a goat, a raven, a deer, a donkey, oxen. And he's got these two here called the behemoth and leviathan. Some will jump to the conclusion there, oh, those two are mythological. Why? Why jump to that conclusion? The, the, we have nothing to say they're mythological. Why would the two out of the twelve not be real? Do you have anything to say they're not real? No, we don't. So, why not take a look at the details given to us about these and maybe find out, do we have an idea of what they might be? We might. We might not. So let's start with the first one here in Behemoth. If you have your Bibles, Job chapter 40, you can take a look at that there, and you can see all the different characteristics given to this creature. First detail we're given, is it what? Eats grass. Right there, that narrows it down to what? Plant eater. An herbivore. Exactly. So we know that narrows it down. We take out the meat eaters. And so... I'm trying to find a specific, yeah, that's my favorite verse about it. I'm going to come to that. Okay. Um, strength in the loins, muscles in the belly. This thing has massive muscle structure. Big, massive muscle structure. Stiff tail like a what? 
a cedar, bones like bronze, limbs like bars of iron, lives in reeds and marsh, walks through turbulent rivers. Okay, so this thing has massive bone structure, incredible muscle structure. It's just the largest creature ever to walk the planet. And a distinguishing characteristic about it is it has what? Stiff tail like a cedar. When the Bible mentions the cedar, it often is in reference to the cedars of Lebanon. If you recall, those were the, the most impressive, most magnificent ones in all the land. And Solomon had them imported in to build the temple. Because these are the biggest and the best. They're incredible. So we're looking for a creature that would be massive muscle, massive bone, plant eater, humongous tail. We got dinosaurs up here. What are you thinking? <laughs> You're thinking a dinosaur, exactly. How about this guy? Over in the museum at the University of Oklahoma, um, Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History, we have an apatosaurus there we can go look at. And he's got this tail. Notice how it goes up and around and comes back around like this. Because this tail is 30 feet long and 5 feet thick, and that's without any muscle, without any tendons, without any skin, that's just bone. That's a, that's a pretty big tail. Would you say that would qualify as a tail like a giant cedar tree? Sure, why not? Absolutely. However, in your Bible, you may have in your Bible some divinely inspired footnotes. Uh-huh. Yeah, not so much. Okay, But you may have some footnotes. Just not inspired. So, uh, anybody there have a footnote suggestion as to what this creature might be? A what? Hippopotamus. Yeah, that's got a giant tail there, doesn't it? <laughs> Big tail, huh? hippopotamus. Some might say elephant. How big of a tail does a hippopotamus or an elephant have? Not, not, not much of one, does it? No. Why? What? what? I said it could have been the trunk, they say. Or it could have been the trunk, yes, because, because the word tail can refer to the front of an animal. <laughs> I actually looked that up because I've seen that. You're exactly right. Some will make that excuse. Oh, it's referring to the trunk of the... And I looked up the word tail in the Hebrew, and it means the rear end, the back end, the tail hanging down. It, it can't be the front at all, okay? It's, it's, but why, why in our footnotes would it make those kinds of suggestions? They don't have any other They don't have. They think dinosaurs are prehistoric. They don't think they could have lived at the same time. They might think it's kind of an embarrassing thing to have the uh, this dinosaur here or something. It sounds like a worldview issue. But think about this first before you jump to a ah, I can't believe I did that kind of thing, response. Think about this. King James is translated what year? 1611. We don't start finding dinosaur fossils till the 1800s. So, at the time, and you got the Geneva Bible before that, and okay, at the time, what is their understanding of the biggest land animal on the planet? Elephant or hippopotamus. Are those animals to uh, be messed around with? No. No. Elephants kill more people in Africa than any other, or, I'm sorry, hippopotami. I made that word up. Hippopotamus, this is, okay, kill more people in Africa each year than any other animal. They're dangerous. You don't mess with them. You don't get in the water with them, okay? So for them, the biggest land creature of the time is a hippopotamus or an elephant. Now think about that. Before we even had their fossils to go look at a museum, your Bible has described in perfect detail a sauropod dinosaur. How amazing is your Bible? It's a true word. It's a true word, absolutely. So sauropod dinosaurs, those are the long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Everybody say sauropod. Sauropod. So you got Brachiosaurus, you got Apatosaurus, you got Sauroposidon. You've got ones like this guy. This is the Patagotitan. It is the biggest ever discovered to date. 
We got to see him, Bob, Matt, and myself, we got to see him in the Chicago Field Museum. Where he's standing is where Sue the T-Rex used to be. She's itty bitty compared to this guy. So they got this and they moved Sue to her own new brand new exhibit that they opened up this year. And so if you want to kind of get an idea of how big this guy is, uh, let me see here. Oh, there, there's me right there standing beside him. If you get a chance, it, it's worth seeing. It, it, it's incredible. He, he looks all the way up into the second. You can literally go up there in the balcony and he's looking right at you. It's pretty neat. He measures 122 feet long. 122. And uh, so this is a, re a, a research replica, just like these guys. Okay, like we said, most museums have. But notice over here, those are the actual rock fossil leg bones. They have some of them there on display. So that was really cool to see. And they had big signs like, right here, this is the real thing. Okay, kind of thing. Uh, would you say that would meet the description of a behemoth? Yeah, Absolutely, 100%. Now then, now then, now then, we still have that footnote in there today. We know better today. So there's probably worldview leaking in, a non-biblical worldview leaking into your footnotes. That's why you need to be careful about footnotes and about study Bibles. You need to study the Bible, okay? The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. 100% of the time, okay? Now, I'm not saying don't ever read any commentaries or studies. We need to study. But just understand that, okay? Man's Word versus God's Word. We take God's Word every time. Now, um, going back to this whole, well, the Bible might have dinosaurs in it living with people. Job is written after the flood. That means, what might I find records of in ancient civilizations? What, what might I find records of? Might I find some behemoths in other, other civilizations? There's actually, the word behemoth shows up in Egyptian cultures and uh, Arabian cultures as well. But guess what we actually do find depictions of in other civilizations? This is a cylinder seal that, you, that a, a government official would roll out and put his seal on something. And when you roll it out, look at what we've got. We've got long neck, long tailed, four legged big creatures. What does that look like? Like a sauropod dinosaur, doesn't it? Okay. And, and what, what are they doing with their necks? They're, they're interlocking them. Okay. You see that? See them interlocking them? Okay. That dates to around 2000 BC in Asia. We go down to Africa. I've got some rains there. Um, we've got this... Um, We've got this stella, this palette, this plate that is the centerpiece of the Cairo Museum. I got to see it in 2010 when I got to go to Egypt. And when you walk in the Cairo Museum, the big Egyptian, all the big amazing Egyptian artifacts, it is front and center right there in this glass. And it's really important because supposedly it was made by the first king of all of Egypt who ruled over both upper and lower Egypt. He reigned over it all. And this, this dates back to him, the first one that reigned over it. So it's big deal. The tour guide takes him over to look at this side. I went around to the other side because I wanted to see this side. Let me show you why. There's a little more enhanced view that they have at the Discovery Center in Dallas. Notice what's on this side. Big, long neck, kind of long-tailed, but four-legged creatures. And they even have kind of a leash on them. Kind of interesting. And what are they doing with their necks? They're interlocking them. That's in Asia. We go up to England. 1496, Bishop Bell is buried in the Carlisle Cathedral. And let me show you here. Oh, that's the wrong one. In this book that we carry, Untold Secrets of Planet Earth about dire dragons, it has in here the pictures of these two long neck, long tailed dinosaurs, and this is on this brass engraving is on his on his um, his burial plot there in the church building. What do you notice those dinosaurs are doing in the engraving? They're interlocking their necks. Everybody see that? Everybody see that? Isn't that it? It wasn't until last year somebody came up to me after teaching about this. I was showing, hey, look, we got sauropod dinosaurs in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Three continents. 
And somebody came up and said, do you realize what we've got there? I said, well, yeah, we got Sir Pod. He said, no, 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 no. Do you realize what we've got there? I was like, what? He said, what are they doing with their necks? Was, well, they're intertwined. Oh, we don't only have depictions of them. We have depictions of observed behavior of these creatures on three different continents. I about floored me there. I was like, I had the pictures. Didn't even realize what I had. That's, woo! You got to do a Matt Miles impression. Yeah! Okay, there you go. Man, that got me excited. How cool is that? So, this behemoth matches the depiction of Sir Pod Dinosaur, and we have records of them in other civilizations after the flood. Exactly as we would expect from what the Bible tells us and what Job probably saw. There's another creature, though, here in Job that gives us a little more mystery. A little more mystery, not exactly sure what this one is, but we're going to talk about it for just a second, and that is the Leviathan. In chapter 41, we find out that this creature, he can't be caught with a fish hook, so that tells us where does he live? In the water. And he is terrifying, he has mighty strength, he has a splendid frame, strong scales. Probably not a fish, by the way this is described. These scales would be more reptilian type, which are big bumps of, of keratin, of skin, okay? And tear around the teeth, could eat iron like straw, bronze like rotten wood. So we, this thing's got a massive mouth, major teeth on it. Back row is made of shields that clasp together so air can't penetrate. Do you hear the details? This doesn't sound like something just made up of wind. And then it's got flames. Go Ooh. Oh, flames. Ooh. And the smoke from the... Oh. What is that? That sounds like a fire breathing... Oh, no, 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 no. The Bible has a fire breathing dragon. No, oh, they're going to laugh at us. They're going to make fun of our Bible. We got a fire breathing drag. Oh, let, let's. Okay, strong neck, big heart, leaves a big way. Oh, what are we talking about here? Some kind of big reptilian, big mouthed creature lives in the water. Do we have anything in the fossil record that is a large reptilian creature with a big mouth? Anybody heard of the Mosasaurus? Yeah, that's a pretty big one, isn't it? Mosasaurus, 59 feet long, 7 tons. You can fit a Volkswagen Beetle in his mouth. That's a big creature. Um, our Tylosaurus over here, this guy over here, those big teeth. Uh, we have, that one is Bunker. Everybody say hi, Bunker. Hi, Bunker. Hi, Bunker is the biggest one ever found, 45 feet long. We have down uh, in a... Um, at a college, uh, in, a, in a museum, uh, Sophie, I like to call her uh, his little sister. She's 39 feet long, okay? And just to give you an idea of how big she is, Matt kind of talked about it. There's me holding my son Gideon in her stomach there, you know, because, you know, every little child needs nightmares. And um, <laughs> that's how big she is. There's Mr. Matt standing right there. There is my wife standing right there and my dad. And so we, yeah, you can see... Big creatures, okay? Would you say this is a terrifying creature? Absolutely. They even depicted one of these in Jurassic World here recently. You know, so. Terrifying, yes. I see, I saw many of you terrified there. Okay. Now, in the footnote, in the footnote, it says, or maybe it could have been what? A crocodile. Okay, now let's talk about that for a second. Anybody ever been to, it's amazing how many have, anybody ever been to Gatorland in Eustis, Florida? There you go. Okay, we got some down there near Orlando. Uh, there's also some other parks down there that have gators in there. I've been to Gatorland before in, in Eustis, Florida, because it's a cheap attraction, okay? But it's really good. It's fun to go to. And they have a session where you go and you sit in the bleachers, and they go down. A guy goes down there, and he wrestles up a gator. He pulls it up by the tail, and he sets it on there. And then he does fancy tricks where he opens the mouth of it and shows you the teeth and all that kind of stuff. And then after the show, he says, okay, now come on down here. You can t bring your child... And Give me about $5 and send your child inside with me. I then will sit him on the gator, step back, and you take a picture. <laughs> you can pay him money to do that. I 
always wanted to do it. My wife says no. And so, <laughs> if you can send the child in there and sit on the gator and the child's just fine, does that sound like the terrifying creature of Job 41? No. no. However, if their worldview is okay with this, Mr. Matt showed you a picture last night. We've got him in this book, Monumental Monsters. Everything we see alive today we can find in the fossil record. Did you know that? Every kind of animal we find today, you can find the fossil record. All 32 mammalian orders are right there with dinosaurs. They usually don't tell you that, though, do they? But it's all right there together. But the thing about things that are alive today that we find the fossil record, they're humongous. They're ginormous. And Mr. Matt showed you a crocodile last night called the, anybody remember? Sargosuchus. Who said that? Man, he was. He's smart. He's paying attention there. Sargosuchus. This gator, look at this guy. That's his head compared to today's gator. Okay? Look at that guy. Massive. He was, what did he say last night? 40 feet long, 10 tons. That's a gator. If that is what kind of crocodile we mean by Leviathan, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Because that is, Matt, can you catch that with a fish hook? I don't think so. Absolutely not. This is a massive, massive reptilian-like creature. Okay. Now, we're told, though, in other passages of Scripture, these things would swim out in the ocean and around ships and stuff like that. So maybe not a gator. What is it? I'm going to tell you. I don't know. I don't know what this creature is. I'm not going to stand up here and try to make it up for you. Okay, I'm not going to do that. But there's still that one little detail about this one. What can it do? It can breathe fire. Have we ever observed fire breathing in the animal world? Shake your heads like this. You may not have, but scientists have. Let me show you scientifically observed fire breathing. Dr. Job Martin is going to tell you about it. Well, the first thing that we really studied together was this little bug called a vomitor beetle. And this little insect is about a half inch long, and it mixes chemicals that explode. So I began to think, okay, now how would that evolve? And let's say if evolution is true, and you're evolving along here, and you don't have a defense mechanism, because that is the defense mechanism of the bug. So if evolution is true, it had to somehow evolve that. So let's say it's coming along here. Well, the first time it evolves the, the explosion, what does it do to the bug? Boom, you just splattered your bug, okay? So splattered bug pieces don't evolve. So I thought, well, how, how, how could this have happened? Well, it doesn't blow itself up. It has another little factory inside itself that manufactures chemicals, a chemical, acts as a catalyst so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. Well, the first time it manufactured that little chemical, it, it, here it goes again, blew itself up again. But it doesn't. Why? Well, because it has like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. So it has uh, like twin tail tubes. And it can aim these tail tubes all the way up, out the side, out the front. Let's say a spider is coming up toward its side and it doesn't have time to turn around and shoot. Uh, it can just take its little oh, gun turret, it aim shot it out the there, spider. and shoot. The, the explosion on this little bug, all you hear, if, if you're listening as a human, you hear this pop. But scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion. And it's like, it's like about a thousand sequential little explosions, but they're so fast, all we hear is one pop. And so you think, well, now, why would that be? Well, that was a curious thing for the scientists that study this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University, some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes, whoop, bang, and shoots it, he's going to pop himself right out of there. It's like lighting a burner on a jet engine, and so he's out of there. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. How would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. There is no way a slow, gradual process is going to produce this bug. There's no way uh, even the newest theories of evolution like punctuated equilibrium, which means evolution happens very fast. Well, there's no way that will explain this little bug. 
So notice, in scientifically observed fire breathing, we have a chemical reaction of a boiling flash vapor, gas flash vapor, expelled from the creature. Did you read Job 41 carefully? Let me show you. This is what the Bible actually says about this fire-breathing creature. Its snorting throws out what? Flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as a boiling pot over burning. A gas flash vapor. Exactly as we've seen in the animal kingdom of fire breathing. Long before scientists ever discovered that, your Bible described it in perfect detail. How amazing is your Bible? Pretty cool. So, here's what it boils down to. They're going to say that those who are anti-Bible, going to try to antagonize about it, they're going to say, okay, so this is what you believe in. You believe in fire-breathing dragons. My first response is, okay, wait a minute. Who is it who's trying to put feathered wings on these creatures? And really believes in fairy tales? But this is what they're saying. Okay, so you believe in all these dragon fairies. You believe in every dragon and tale? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say I believe in every dragon fairy tale. Sometimes things get exaggerated. But it doesn't mean the creature wasn't real. Have we seen that in any movies? Sunday night, Sunday night, Sunday night. Yeah. Did they exaggerate what T-Rex can do? Oh, by quite a bit. Does that mean T-Rex never existed? No, no. no it doesn't. Multi-headed dragons. Do you believe in that? Well, no, of course not, because multi-headed animals never, ever happens, right? We never have multi-headed animals ever. Do oh, what, what? We do have multi-headed? Yeah, sure we do. Of course we do. It happens sometimes. It's a birth defect. It does take place sometimes. Can you imagine if you found an Albertosaurus who had a two-headed defect? Would that not make a great story? Can you imagine a two-headed T-Rex? I mean, that is, is it possible? Yeah. Can you imagine if we found any of these creatures with a birth defect of multi-head, what are they going to do? Yeah, that's exactly right. They're going to freak out. Because that's just like, what have we been saying all along? It could, would that not be a story for legends and fairy tales? Absolutely. Does that mean the creature, though, never existed? Absolutely not. We've seen that with the whole fire-breathing thing. We've seen that with the multi-headed. Uh, there's another one in your Bible that's mentioned sometimes and brought up in ridicule. Unicorns. Did you know your Bible talks about nine times? Not just in the King James, there are five other versions that use this word and translate it. Some say, well, maybe it was a birth defect kind of thing. The word is re'aim, re'aim. And it's used, um, like I said, nine times. And today they translate the word as ox. There's a problem with that. The Bible actually has a specific word for ox. It's the word shor. And then there's another word for oxen. It's bakar. So why would we need a third word for ox? We don't. The word ra'aim literally means rising up. It's reference to a very large, pretty solid creature that had this rising up characteristic about it. It had this trait of something big coming up out of it. A single thing coming. A horn is what the understanding is. Does that sound like the unicorns we have today? In, fair, in, our, in our cars? No. But does that mean the unicorn never existed? Let me show you what's called the Great Siberian Unicorn. Exists much, and I love the headlines. It exists much more recently than... It's uh, called the Elasmotherium. It's a big mammal, kind of like an ox kind of thing. Uh, not necessarily more of a horse, more of an ox. It's not a rhinoceros, even though that depiction makes it look like. There's all kinds of different depictions of what this thing would look like. But it had this large, large horn coming out. And I love the latest secular science on this, because here's what they have to admit. Uh, it may have actually walked the earth with modern-day humans. You don't say. <laughs> 
So here's if if, if you got anything from night, you can go home, back to back to home, back to school, wherever, and say unicorns are real. <laughs> oh, the little girls are so excited right now. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Guess what we find all around the world. We keep finding depiction after depiction after depiction of what look like extinct animals today that are supposedly millions and millions of years old, yet if they've been extinct for millions and millions of years, how then could all these civilizations be making these depictions? This one came from uh, Italy after a landslide it was revealed. It it's a, dates around 1000 BC. It's got shields on the back and, count them, four spikes on the tail. What is that? Where my dinosaur guys? Stegosaurus. Four spikes on the tail. Not three, not six, four. Exactly like Stegosaurus. Uh, we've got uh, over in Utah, another depiction of what looks like a sauropod dinosaur. And it's funny, I wanted to see what the evolutionary response to this was. Here's what his response was. He said, this was an actual scientific paper. They said, well, at 50 yards away with binoculars, it looked like a mud stain. I kept reading. That was it. That's all they did in their scientific research. It was a peer-reviewed scientific published paper. The actual Bible-believing scientists, which yes, that does exist, went and actually got stepladders, got up close to it, looked at it, took samples, and they said, no, this, was, this is not just a mud stain. This was actual art that was put on this, on this uh, rock face uh, with all the other depictions that go along with it. Uh, Dennis Fields was a missionary in Australia. He heard uh, the, the natives telling the story about the Yaru. Okay? And this, the legend was that a little girl fell in the water and this thing came up and swallowed her. And it was a sad story. He's like, wow, that's crazy. I wonder what that thing looked like. And I said, well, we can show you. He said, you can't. Oh, the tribal artist can show you a picture of what, of what has been handed down to our ancestors and what it looked like. He said, well, okay, that's cool. Right. He, he didn't know what to expect. And then they brought him the painting from the tribal artist. He got back to the States, gave it to Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis. They've got it. Uh, it's got four flippers, long neck. It looks just like a plesiosaur. Even has the skeletal structure and the digestive system and the little girl in the stomach. And you put that right up to a real plesiosaur and it matches right up. Now here's the deal. They didn't have any textbooks to go look up what a plesiosaur looked like. Biggest one, 49 foot, skull of 9 foot. Think that could swallow a little girl? Sure it could. Over in Cambodia, there's a temple Buddhist monastery, a uh, university kind of uh, facility there, built in the late 1100s. Okay, late 1100s. You go in, you walk around, you get inside there. By this doorway here is this long, uh, large column uh, with reliefs uh, carved into it. And right there is that one there. What's that look like? Looks like Stegosaurus. It's got these little shields on her, okay, everything. Uh, in June of 2017, David Wutzel, who does this book here, Chronicles of Dinosauria, and has a lot of these different depictions I'm showing you tonight and many more, he went over there to study it because he wanted to figure out what this was. There, see, there were issues with it because, for one, it's got these shields on it, which some said, well, that's just plants in the background. Well, he went and did the actual study on it. He said, no, it's not. It's part of the actual creature. He can show you that. But on the, on the head here, it has this cone shape that looks like it's going over the whole head with his, with his mouth and the eye. And it's like, what is on his head? It's like there's something over the whole head. And, there's, and it comes up to this cone and there's a ring at the top. What is that? After he got done studying that, he went inside all the complexes and kept looking and searching. And he came across the same depiction on the wall, on the inside. And there it is with the shields on the back. And where that ring is there, there was this, looked like a ring with a rope, a leash on it. Well, that's interesting. If you had something that strong and big, would you hook it up and pull stuff around? Would you leash it and use its, its power? We, we, have we done that with animals before in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Why is that interesting? Because you go up to China at the same time. Oh, wait a minute. Here's how evolutionists explain that. You ready? 
This is a guy named Glenn Cuban. He's the one they, that everybody goes to about, well, how do we explain that? How do we explain that? He said, here's how you explain that. These, these, all four of these pictures are from his website. These are, these are his pictures. He said, that is obviously not a stegosaurus. It is either a rhinoceros or a chameleon. And I looked at that and I said, well, you know, that guy's got a point there. Rhinoceros, chameleon, I get those two confused all the time. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Anyway, at the same time that that thing was, was, that carving was made, in China, for going back to 1600 B.C., all the way up until the time of that temple being built down in Cambodia, they had all kinds of records, not just legends, records from their emperors in their dynasties of dragon rearers, dragon tamers, the sacred dragons being raised in the palace. Uh, the Song Dynasty talked about all of these kinds of things. And at the same time as the Te Prom temple that has that stegosaur in it, we have the record of the uh, Song Dynasty and the emperor, Huang Di, who would, who would hook up his chariot to six large reptiles to pull his chariot. So, so think about that. At the exact same time in history, we have a record of large reptiles being hooked up to pull something. At the same time, we have the depiction just south of there of a stegosaur being harnessed. Interesting correlation. Not only that, there's this. Marco! Every time. That's good. He didn't disappoint. He published his book in 1298 of when he went to China in the 1200s. And he talked about, so this is about 100 years later, he talked about when he went there, there was this province of Karazhan, and seen here are huge serpents, big reptiles, 10 paces in length, 10 spans of the girded body, the forepart near the head. They have two itty bitty legs. And they have, with three claws, like those of a tiger, eyes, big eyes, and their jaws are huge and menacing, big enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp. They're so formidable, neither animal or man or anybody wants to go near one of these things. T-Rex. What's that sound like? T-Rex. Sounds like T-Rex. Now, he goes into incredible detail about this creature. We're talking about a theropod. Theropods have the big legs and the arms. Okay, so T-Rex, the raptors, uh, Albertosaurus, they're theropods. Everybody say theropod. 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 You're going to be so smart about dinosaurs. Here we go. He was, these creatures were causing problems with their livestock, getting into things, messing up stuff. And so they would set traps for them. And Marco Polo goes into all these details about setting traps, about how they'd hide these spikes in the ground, they cover it up, and the, when they knew he was coming there, set a little prey, uh, little meal for it, so it would come that way. And then once it stepped on that and was injured, then they pounced on it with their spears and all this stuff. And he goes all this deep. Then he talks about how they butcher it, and how they would use some of the fat and some of the in, in, some of the insides of it to make medicines and salves. Some of it to help. Uh, one of it was to help help dogs with a sickness. One of it was to help uh, ladies while they were in labor, to help speed along their... I mean, there's just all this kind of detail. And the best part, when they got to eat the meat. Oh, it was the best delicacy in all the land. Was it? Well, I mean, anybody here ever had like gator tail, you know, or rattlesnake meat or anything like that? You know, yeah, that's pretty good. Can you imagine that tail? Woo! <laughs> that's tasty right there. That's what I'm thinking. That's what we talk about. So what kind of animal are we talking about? T-Rex. Sounds like T-Rex. But look at the details. Marco Polo specifically said this big reptile had big reptile with itty bitty arms, big mouth, sharp teeth, had how many claws? Three claws. T-Rex has how many? He's got two. So, we've got to look at the details. Somewhere in the fossil record, we've got to find a creature that has, that is around, well, how long did he say it was? 25 feet and has three claws. Have we ever found anything in the fossil record like that? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The Allosaurus averages 28 feet. And guess how many claws he has? Three. Three. 
Some historians will say Marco Polo exaggerated his stories. He may have, but isn't it amazing how when he was making up this creature in his exaggerated stories that he just happened by accident to describe in perfect detail an Allosaurus dinosaur. Like I said, it, the list goes on and on. We could take a tour around the world and looking at these. That's what Vance Nelson did in this book. He went around the world and he got these depictions from tapestries, paintings, carvings, like we showed you, and, and collected them. And then he came back to a professional computer generation company that makes dinosaurs for like uh, TV shows, National Geographic, stuff like that. And he said, I want you to make me these dinosaurs and I want them to be scientifically accurate based on the fossils, based on everything we know about them. I want them to be accurate. And they said, okay, well, we'll make them. You just got to tell us what position and what color. He said, I'll do that for you. He didn't tell them what he had back at home. He then got the collection and then put them side by side. And this book, Dire Dragons, is the result of it. You know, those Chinese dragons that they show us, you know, and say, have you seen all the different varieties of Chinese dragons? These are Chinese dragons. This is my favorite one. Now here's where it all comes back around to our worldview and what we believe about dinosaurs in the Bible. How could all these depictions be perfectly scientifically accurate based on our understanding today? And we don't find the first documented dinosaur fossils until 1824. We don't get the name dinosaur until 1841. And the first time we try to put one of these together and what it looks like is until 1854. And that monstrosity down there on the left is what it looked like. How could they make all these accurate depictions of dinosaurs when we don't have any fossils sometimes hundreds or thousands of years later? What's the logical, rational explanation? Doesn't have anything to do with faith. What's the logical, rational explanation? They saw them with their own eyes. It's the only way to explain that. They're going to still make fun of all of it. Say it's all a bunch of made up stuff you crazy Christians are trying to believe. They'll call it the science of cryptozoology. Whatever. I believe the Bible is accurate in what it tells about dinosaurs. How about you? Okay, so last thing, last thing, okay? Here's the last thing. If they lived after the flood, and we have records of them living with people on every continent, except Antarctica, not too many people live there, what's the next question? Where'd they go? Where are they at today? Why don't we have them alive today? That's a great question. When you find out, let me know. Uh, what are we told? What are we told? What are we told happened to the dinosaurs? What it? Meteorite, asteroid, came down, killed them. Okay, that's what we're told. That's what we're told. That's what's taught. That's the most popular idea. Actually, as Matt told you, there are somewhere between 50 to 100 extinction ideas because they don't have a clue. But I had the amazing privilege of going to the Oklahoma University Museum that I showed you the picture of from earlier. And one of the museum curators was there. And she had 30 years experience of digging up dinosaur fossils. And that's why she had the job there. And uh, she proceeded to tell us all her entire 30 years of history of digging up dinosaurs. But besides that point, we came around to a spot where it talked about extinction. And she said, oh, here's the part about how the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Would you like to know how the asteroid killed the dinosaurs? I said, I sure would. <laughs> My father-in-law will stand there and raise his hand in testimony. This is exactly what happened. She said, here's what happened. Big asteroid comes down, strikes the planet. When that happens, massive tidal waves go out, tsunamis, and the impact of the explosion from that killed everything near it within a certain radius. I said, that makes sense so far. She said, okay, then when you have an explosion like that, it's going to send all this debris up into the atmosphere. I said, I'm with you. I understand. She says, then it's going to come down. What happens when stuff comes down through the atmosphere? catches on fire. So she said, now you've got all of these fiery darts, all these fiery debris raining down, coming back down at the at out of the atmosphere towards the planet's surface. I said, oh, this is getting good. And then she says, here's what happened. All other living creatures 
were smart enough to find their holes and caves in the ground and hide. But the dinosaurs did what any good central Missourian person would do and went out and said, oh, let's watch. <laughs> And thus, the reason only dinosaurs went extinct, did, that ever, did anybody ever think about that when they talk about this? It killed only dinosaurs? Everything else survived? We still have everything alive today? It's because only the dinosaurs were not smart enough to go hide when this event took place. I saw it at the university level. Do you understand now why there's so many other ideas out there? Because none of these make sense. There's one, I, my, one, another one. The aliens killed them. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. Aliens came, looked, and explored our early primordial planet, and they brought with them some of their own diseases and, uh, and pathogens and things like that, and the dinosaurs just happened to not be immune to one of their viruses, and therefore it killed off only dinosaurs and no other animals. As a teacher, I used to like to tell my students because they made bad choices, so you need to make good choices. <laughs> but my favorite, and usually the one that all of the middle school and younger students like the best, is the one about where there was a change, bacteria probably, uh, in their eating, in their plants, in their, in their diets, that started causing problems with their gastrointestinal tracts, which then caused them to start to produce excessive amounts of methane that then eventually suffocated them to death. <laughs> Look at all of you sinners out there laughing at this good science. <laughs> oh my goodness. Might the Bible have an explanation for us? Yeah, it actually might. Would you go give me a timeline? Thank you. Um, in all of the models, in all of the models about the flood, they're different kinds, okay? When you plug in the data of what would have happened to our planet after the flood, just, just hold for a second, um, they always, always, always result in an ice age that takes place after the flood, okay? There's an ice age that takes place after the flood. Let me show you how that works real quick, okay? Because we, we're, we're doing good on time here. Uh, oh, and by the way, when we talk ice age, we don't mean the entire planet covered in ice. Ice age usually refers to about 30% of the surface is covered in ice, with glacials uh, taking place from the North and South Pole, okay? So that, just so you get a good picture of it. That's what the ideas are. Now then... What would have happened with the flood and what took place? Remember, if you were paying attention, Mr. Matt, he told you this. How many of the fountains of the deep broke forth? All of them. So you have massive volcanic activity, magma, all this stuff coming up to the surface is going to help create new uh, plates, new surface, all this kind of stuff, ocean floor and everything. And so you're going to have all this evaporation of the oceans, all this water going up into the atmosphere. Plus, what does a volcano put up in the atmosphere? A bunch of, uh, yeah, ash, tephra, and all this other stuff in there. When the largest uh, recorded uh, uh, volcano took place in Mount Tambora in Indonesia in the 1850s, I think it was, it lowered the entire global temperature one to three degrees, depending on where you're living at. That's just one. The whole global temperature, just one volcano did that. Can you imagine all of them going off? Okay, so you're going to have all that in the atmosphere. So what takes place then is you have all of this moisture going over, over the colder land masses, plus all of this stuff blocking sunlight and heat, so you're going to get a lot of snow happen. Okay, we understand that. We're going to get a lot of snow happening. The thing is, though, because of the lower temperature, what's going to happen that summer? It's not all going to melt. So the next winter, what's going to happen? It's going to snow on top of that. Come to the next summer, is it going to melt? No. So then it builds on top of that the next winter, and the cycle keeps going on. And the models show us that this would have, gone, would have peaked somewhere around 500 years of this happening. And possibly finally ending about 700 years this would have gone on until it was completely done. Anywhere from five to seven hundred years is when that takes place. Okay, so you have all this stuff happening. Your Bible even kind of might mention that. If Job is written in like around the time of Abraham, that had been right in the middle of all this. 
And it's interesting that the book of Job records more about snow and ice than any other book of the Bible. From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven who has given a birth? Water becomes hard like stone and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. Interesting. So, those lower water levels would have exposed all the continental land bridges. You could walk from, from Asia all the way down to Australia. Because the water level would have been low enough that you could have walked all the way down. That's how you get animals there. That's how you get uh, isolated animal groups in Australia. Because then when the ice age ends and it all starts melting, what's going to happen to the ocean levels? It's all going to go up, okay? And that's how you get your islands and your... That's also then when people would have started moving around and populated the earth. Anybody ever done the Me 23 stuff? Find out your genetic history and all that stuff? It's interesting. They're using that now and showing us we came from three paternal lines that then went out and populated the whole planet. Three maternal lines. Hmm. How many couples came off the ark and started having kids? Isn't that interesting? Mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA are telling us which mother we came from and where that, that family moved out with. And it matches up exactly with the table of nations and where the, the families moved to. We love science. So, we wanted to make a timeline to show you the Ice Age on there. Most of them will have the ages, but we want to put the Ice Age on there so you can see it. Because here was something neat. When I put it on there, and I looked at where it ends, according to all the models, when the Ice Age ends, there are a lot of droughts. A lot of worldwide, a lot of droughts around the world, I should say. A lot of famines. It ends right when Jacob moves to Egypt. Why does Jacob move to Egypt? Because there's a seven-year famine in the land. Isn't your Bible amazing? <laughs> it's so good. What does that have to do with dinosaurs? What we can see through history, based on written records and some other observational science, is that since then, we've gone through warming periods, cooling periods. Warming periods, cooling periods. Warming periods, cooling periods. We're just now going through a warming period, but guess what's happened in the last 20 years? We've stopped warming, according to all the data. And we actually may be starting to cool off again. So, what's that have to do with dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are what kind of animals? Cold-blooded reptiles. Maybe a little more active than your standard uh, cold blood. They might have been kind of a little mixed. But in any case, they're going to need warmer climates. That's going to severely limit where they can live. So when they come off the ark, they've got whole new habitat, whole new world they have never seen before. They've got to figure out where they can live, what they can eat, what's available for them. So you're going to have all these environmental pressures on them. You're going to have the ice age and all these warming and cooling periods. So you're going to have all these climate impacts on them, all that pressure on them. You're going to have, what did Marco Polo show us? You're going to have major human impact on you and restricting where you can go and stuff. So are they going to be able to just flourish around the planet like they did before the flood? No, they're going to be severely limited. Here's the cool thing that we're starting to see in the research, what the data is showing us. Remember how we are getting depictions all around the world and we know when those depictions were made? Guess what? They're matching up with where we see dinosaurs and when we see them is matching up with where we find warmer climates and when we find them matches with the dinosaurs. So that when Bishop Bell has the pictures of the sauropods in England, guess what? It's really warm in England then. Not saying they were living there, but they may have migrated farther north where he may have seen them. But here's the crazy thing. After Bishop Bell and after those guys, we enter into the Little Ice Age. Guess when it is we see the very last depictions of dinosaurs? Is at the beginning of this Little Ice Age. And so whatever remaining dinosaurs had made it to that point in time... That little ice age came about and again, once again, restricted it. People hunting them as Marco Polo recorded and all this other stuff. The very last ones we see in any depictions dates to around five to six hundred years ago. About the time of the pilgrims, about the time of Columbus, about the time of Columbus. It's the last time we see them. Does that mean there aren't any alive today? 
Can't say that. Doesn't mean we won't ever find anything uh, like one of these things alive again. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, all the data, everything we've come here and studied every night, what's it tell us? It tells us the answer to that question. Can you trust the Word of God? Absolutely. So can we trust it when it tells us that God created this universe in six days around 6,000 years ago? Yes. yes, there's nothing science-wise to say that there's anything wrong with that. Only worldview has an issue with that. That's why we've been hammering this whole idea of worldview every night. That's why William asked us to talk about that. Do we have any problem then with humans living with dinosaurs? No, there's no science that says there's anything wrong with that. Do we have any problem with a global flood and a family of eight and all the animals surviving on the ark? Is there any problems with that? No, there's not. We can trust what it tells us. So then, can we trust it when it tells us about God loving us? Giving His Son for us? That there's hope? That there's salvation? We can be forgiven of our sins? Can we trust it when it tells us that? Yes. Yeah, because here's what Jesus said about that. Jesus told us. I want you to check this out. In John chapter 3, there's a religious leader who comes to Jesus. And he says, I've got questions. Because you obviously are the great teacher. You're the one that has the answers. And so Jesus starts giving him answers. But he's like, oh, I don't know if I, if I get that. I don't know. That's kind of hard to believe. And Jesus finally just pauses in, in verse 12. And this is our theme verse for a Creation Truth Foundation for our ministry. And Jesus says, I've told you all these earthly things and you don't believe. How are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? Do you get the challenge? Jesus has challenged us, has told us, you take this book right here, this Bible, you go check anything it says, anything, people, places, events, locations, geographical features, any type of historical occurrence, any scientific claim, and Jesus says, if just one detail of that doesn't prove to be right, you just, you, just, you just chuck that thing. You don't need it. But if, and when you do go check it out, and you find that every part of this is absolutely true, the things you can see, guess what else is true? The things we can't yet see. Amen. Jesus thinks this book is so amazing. He will literally bet your eternity on it. Will you trust your life with it? Father, thank you.